Well, good morning, Julie. Good evening, Ed. Hi, how are you? This is Ed Reether in the United States outside of Boston and it's October 24th and Julie Anderson in Australia on the 25th of yes. October. And you're Sunday and I'm Monday. Yeah, yes. so, tell me how the, so tell me how the day looks. <laughs> Uh, well, it's beautiful here. Obvious, it's an opposite opposite season to you, but um, uh, it's just it's gorgeous. It's it's rather still today, so it's a bit humid where we are. Uh, but bright sun and beautiful blue sky with some puffy clouds, and yeah, you can smell the ocean. <laughs> oh, wonderful! Yeah. Wonderful. So um, we spoke uh, a couple of weeks ago, and this is um, another opportunity to get together and talk about uh, Adida. And um, I, I have been talking with you offline about a couple of um, items that I'm a little bit, uh, well, let's just say it's, uh, it's confusing. And so I thought I would ask you, and I, I, and I know because your time with Adida was very up close and personal throughout yes. all 35 years, or I don't know how many years. So I'm going to ask you as somebody who was up close and personal, uh, because I'm always receiving it as an abstract dharmic reading or a discourse or video or things of that sort. And I'm always on a liability of getting an abstract or a mental perception or understanding of what Adida refers to. And, I, and what I'm pointing to or what I'm going to ask you in detail about is what's called the seventh stage realization. And in that, there's another term called the seventh stage demonstration. And, and what's even a little bit more confusing, there is always the prior condition, which is from Adida's demonstration and revelation, is the already seventh stage realization. Yes. Okay. So you can see from yes. a kind of an academic or a teaching point of view, it's a little bit um, and it's always prior. It's always before any enactment from, if you will, any egoic gesture, contraction. So I, I want to put it in his lifetime, his realization, his time at the Vedanta temple, which is from, from the cultural or personal point of view. It was at the Divan, Divine Enlightenment in 1970 and the Vedanta Temple in Los Angeles that has been acknowledged as being his awakening. Yes, yes. Right. But then even after the awakening, which was in many ways called a reawakening, and I don't want to get into the nuances here. I just want to stay it in a personal kind of manner. So in the 70s, there was the awakening. Now, I'm going to put, I'm going to put it in Adida's life term. So for me, the simple way to say is, as I read it, there are three phases or parts to the seventh stage, full seventh stage translation or ultimate perfect divine enlightenment. Yeah. Right? So as I was saying, I would like to put this seventh stage understanding into his life because there was there are three phases. One is called the transfiguration stage, 
One is called the transformation stage and one is called the, the brightening or the um, outshining, yes. How, outshining phase. There's also the indifference. Okay. <laughs> so, which I, is I'm, in between in 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 between the um the trans yeah transformation and outshining and yes yeah, so so go ahead and as you as usual yeah, yeah. And, and, <laughs> and, and, and just and just so i can not be too coarse with this the indifferent phase is not a fuck you phase Absolutely not. <laughs> no, it's incredibly compassionate, as a matter of fact. <laughs> okay. So yeah. I, I want to just put it, since you were in, as I say, up close and personal. So I want to just paint a picture, and then you, I'll, I'll ask you about his life and what you saw in these different phases. So I'm going to just put it in from 1970 to the divine emergence, I will say that is the transfiguration stage from the divine emergence in 1986 to 2000 was the transformation stage. And from 2001 to 2008 was the, the translation stage. Okay, so yeah. Um, from do, should, so, do you want me to respond now, yeah, or you I, have more? I, so, to say? so you can see what I'm asking for is in your yeah. time with Adida. Yeah. Does any any of the phases can you recognize in in his transformation? Any of these phases in the seventh stage demonstration absolutely absolutely unquestionably and uh as with everything about adi da it was both crystal clear in terms of the obviousness of the feeling of him which is completely tied into how he demonstrated and revealed this these aspects or phases of the seventh stage realization um and then also it, it was completely paradoxical in other words a, a koan that the um devotee beings the world is always being confronted by that was intended to stop the mind and the body's and the heart's seeking urge to be able to comprehend the gifts that were being given by Siddha Da. So in living with him intimately in the years that I did and began to know him from 1975 through his teaching word and and the initiation I received prior to coming into his company, physical company, um, the, the, the phases that you were describing, I'm speaking now in retrospect because of not knowing a lot or anything really when I first received all of the, the gifts of his realization and his person. Um, My understanding now and after having studied and, and practiced an incredible ordeal of intimacy and tapas and in his direct company and in the world and with family, everything, you know, um, the one, one thing that has always been abundantly obvious is the feeling of his person. And uh, it's not as though I'm simply remembering like I would remember my mother or my father or a lover or a friend um, where I can um, visualize or uh, 
remember characteristics about them humanly um, and otherwise, but the feeling of the person that the and and at every single level. So I could I can remember and feel his his skin, um, the the feel and the touch of it and the smell of it and the um, this in sensory fashion I can feel him this way, and I always it's always imbuing this my psychophysical being and therefore um it's it's um become an, a very interesting noticing or observation that everything that i do and i live as a, as a gross body mind is imbued or informed by that at a, a such a profound level that i don't have to um uh intentionally or ritually or whatever it, it, it invoke it or remember it it's like it's a perpetual process of that feeling of his being um at that level but also that is so with the emotional being feeling the, the force of all of his um being sensitive to the force of all of his emotions um that in his his uh his fervor for what he was doing his and, and again at a very human level a very intimate level um, that related to intimate matters of his life, to his work, to his creativity, um, to his enjoyment, to his tapas, to the function, his specifically unique function. Um, and then realizing very, very early on that all of that was is integrated with his one um, being born into a particular function here in this world. Um, so there's, and then there's the mental level, <laughs> you know, of, of cognizing, rec um, recognizing, um, not just merely through thought or, or through uh, perceptual or conceptual means or mechanisms, even with the higher mind, you know, as, as time went on, there were all forms of experiential reception of being able to feel his person, yes, but then the very specific feeling of his being. And um, the only way that I can describe that, and, and again, in using his words, was the, the, the force of the entry of the power of conscious being and light itself, unmodified, the full descent of that that ends up then in coming down so forcefully that it it is a spherical encompassment of everyone, including my entire body mind. So I'm set in him rather than my seeking for internally or externally or in the sphere of experiences or relationships. So I'm describing the feeling of him, which is very essential to understanding his demonstration and his revelation and realization and what you're asking about relative to the four phases of the seventh stage way. Um, so just as I was able to, with complete unknowability, entire mystery, the fact that at 18 years old, I'm this flipperty gibbet of a girl that is, um, what, you know, from my perspective, a, a, a very troubled girl, actually, because life was not okay <laughs> by any stretch of the imagination. And um, but I was still functioning and achieving and succeeding in different ways. But then suddenly, unexpectedly, Citada enters my life, um, and and not just in a very like questionable fashion. Like, hmm, do I have a choice about this? You know, <laughs> or is it? It was all consuming in terms of the, and we've talked about this before, but as I'm describing this, he enters this being, this psychophysical being, okay? So with Adi Da, when you hear, when you read about him or you hear him speak about his life, and as he did with us intimately all the time, and this wasn't just a verbal communication, it was an obs a constant observation of, at a very visceral, and feeling obviousness and oh, 
an incredibly profound gift of precisely the question which, which you are asking, which is that there's the paradox that uh, in his confession, which he came to know, and I'll explain this as we go on, was that he was born as the bright, yet as he describes from birth and at a very specific point in, in his very early life, his feeling, intuitive feeling sense of his condition and everyone and everything was this bright fullness. This, he was awake in the conscious brightness of this fullness and this love, which doesn't require any kind of, of um, verbal capability to be able to comprehend that. It doesn't require anything of the being. It's simply the condition in which everything arises. And conscious, conscious identification with that, that was his condition sitting in the room as a baby. You know, it, just describing the feeling of that tacit intuition and full comprehension and the bliss of it and the samadhi of it. And then he assumed, as we all do, a, a psychophysical form um, embodied in a, an apparent concrete identity and, and in the context of being in, in a sack <laughs> of skin. So his, at this point, as he describes he had he assumed and knows absolutely every single thing about what it is to be completely ordinary <laughs> and this is where people abstract him okay that because he seems to be making these most profound confessions of what was obvious to him when he didn't even have a mind or a capability for discrimination i mean literally in diapers still and mm -hmm. yet and there's often you can feel back to different points in your life like i remember back when I was in diapers, was, was my feeling awareness of that, that I could actually honestly tell you that this was my awakened condition since birth? No. I, I mean, that, that would not be true of me. What I remember, and this is a little bit embarrassing, is my, one of my very first memories is being um, self-conscious about the fact that my poo stank. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, you know, I mean, that, that kind of describes something about the nature of what I felt confined with and what was like shamed by the embarrassment of being in a gross body, you know, mm. and get me the hell out of here kind of a sense. And um, I certainly wasn't aware of this being a blood, blood, you know, love blissful, all bright condition in which there was no problem. That was never defined my sense of, of awareness and reality until bright beloved entered this body mind and then woke me up to a condition that I didn't even know existed. I didn't even have a clue. Okay. Mm. Um, so ima that th imagine this is, this is a human being in New York born as a baby and growing up just as he said, ad adapting to everything completely ordinary. And yet he, unlike most beings, and, and this is not, this is very also true of great Siddha masters throughout all time, realizers, like significant individuals who have demonstrated their realization, not just talked it. You know, they're, yeah. they're actual full, full bodied signs of the unique yoga or the realization of specific and very profound samadhis. Um, or satori's or great wisdom that they fully embody. As a, as a human being. So, Adi Da, this intuition was always, even if it was not um, something he was cognitive of all the time, this was guiding and forming his whole life. Um, it, and because, as we know now, consciousness itself is fundamental and primary to our manifest condition here which more of humanity is becoming aware of in various ways. In other words, we are not just the gross body-mind encapsulated in a brain mechanism that's like a computer and there's nothing outside it. You know, the whole interconnectedness of our life with one another is becoming unveiled in, in terms of this unity and interdependency and the, the wholeness of it, the ecosystem of it, and the... Um, 
profound necessity for that sensitivity to live differently in conscious relationship to what is arising. So here he is as a young boy, and there is this force of awareness and this bright being. And he knows nothing of it. And he goes through and grows as he does. And of course, he will describe it as in the knee of listening, which is really incredible to, to really study the details of his life. Because it is therein that you will actually really understand the process, even more than you would if you were to... Uh, read all of the dharmic teaching. Right. And I'm really serious about this. And he says that. We can abstract. Yeah. He says the book. And, and it's, was, yeah. 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 And um, so, and for me personally, I likewise feel that that's the lesson that I have received is that it was, it's through his bodily human form and the actual process of his demonstration in relationship that has awakened me in terms of the being consciously awake in the process of, of his demonstration and revelation and the uniqueness of conscious light in terms of how we what we do in relationship to that that bars us from living in this fundamental reality truth so <coughs> excuse me um I'm feeling into, as time has gone on, feeling into how much more sensitized I am to his person and his life as I mature in the, like, <laughs> oh my God, what has happened? What has he revealed? This extraordinary, I, I didn't even have a clue. You know, I'm still um, like a babe in the woods in terms of realizing the profundities of what this human being manifested and in a greater appreciation for all human beings who have endured this process of tapas and this, this, the, the, the function of teaching or instructing or, or serving the real true guru saints and sages and siddhas and realizers and the ones from the, from the, the realms and the dimensions that our brain mind doesn't even allow us to um, contact. That, that all of these uh, realities actually are literally real. So um, Adi Da went through his life um, in, in, in that same process of having to grow up, you know, to realize once or reawaken, as you describe at the Vedanta Temple event, to the native condition. And it's described in the ordeal that he went through, which is, is remarkable. Um, and, but what occurred in that event for him was unique to his function, which was that at that point, because it, he, he went through the process of the transcending, which was revealed to him by the bride. It wasn't something he thought of or he made up. He was, as he described, utterly surrendered into the condition of the bright without any sense of, of um, knowledge or technique or seeking. As a matter of fact, it was actually the opposite. Everything that he confronted or came in relationship to prior to the Vedanta Temple event, he noticed not sufficient, not, not, en not enough, not it, not heart satisfying, doesn't meet the mark. I am not a devotee of this. I am not a devotee of this. And it was only in fully when he um, assumed the form of the bright as the self-condition that he's, he, in the Vedanta temple, realized this is the truth of our condition. This is it. Well, if I'm not mistaken, when he went home, after the quote unquote event, he didn't notice anything different. In fact, he, if I'm not mistaken, went home and watched some television with the people who lived in his house. But it was only after the day's passing that he fully understand what yeah, had right. occurred. Right. Yes, yes, yes. And and this is many I've noticed 
uh, him speak about this from very, very early on, all the way through, where all, everybody was a bit baffled. Like, you mean it wasn't like a big, huge event? Right. <laughs> Everybody's envisioning that somehow or other the Enlightenment, that there's some kind of moment or event or big hoo-ha or like, you know, some big gigantic orgasm, you know, a bliss that then eternally radiates and you're constantly having this experiential phenomena. Um, no, 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 no. Not that. That was exactly what he said is not it. Not yeah. it. And, and, and the reason for why that is the case is because um, consciousness itself, even as it is most perf- even as it is most fully realized in the, uh, the tradition of the Gyanis, for example, a, a real actual realizer, not a philosopher. But the Gyani that has been spiritually established in the right side of the heart prior to the, the causal knot or the sinoatrial node, you know, in the yoga, the esoteric anatomy, um, that realization itself is certainly profound. But I'm, we're ta- that, there, that is the self, the Atman excluding conditions, okay? And then, of course, they're the realizers who realize the light of the all brilliant matrix of manifest everyone and everything, reverberations of that. There is that realization also. So there's the realization that is the ascended nirvikalpa of the bright, of the light, and then the, the nirvikalpa, jnana nirvikalpa samadhi, which is associated with the atman, okay? So I'm describing this because what Adi Da realized in the Vedanta temple was the union of the Atmanadi, the Amritanadi, the regeneration of the Amritanadi. And it was at that point that the, um, where he describes transfiguration and transformation in the seventh stage demonstration actually encompassed his entire life from his birth. Because even though he wasn't cognitively aware of the bright guiding him all the time, he did, he, he, he began to be aware of it, but it, the bright manifested through many teachers and many, many forms that were guiding him through his whole life. And um, this is when he realized that his fidelity wasn't to the experiences or the guides or the um, knowledge that was being granted in the midst of phenomena, but it was the, the source the, the one that was prior, as you described earlier on, it was your understanding is correct, that it's, prior, the prior realization. And yet what he describes throughout his whole life, it was always in relationship and coincident with all arising through which his process was always revealed and demonstrated. Okay. And this is really important to understand in relationship to our own process and in direct relationship to him and his Leela. There was never anything that occurred abstractly, dissociatively, effortfully, as a seeker, internal to the body-mind, external to the uh, body-mind, retreated from the world as if the the world was a negative, nasty thing that was just dark and evil, okay? That was not his demonstration at all. As a matter of fact, in living with him, the demonstration of his seventh-stage process and awakening was extremely always intimate in relationship, undoing the barrier with which we were always making or creating and penetrating that through all forms of his humanly spiritual, transcendental, fully given over into and combined with everyone and everything. And his love bliss is the one that guided His manifest love being guided. And I observe this in him all the time. His perfect fidelity. Literally his perfect fidelity to to being shown by truth itself how to serve his function. And therefore, for the transfiguration, transformation, not just in relationship to
his psychophysical being, but everyone and everything. And, and it sounds so highfalutin to say that, but it's true. Mm. <clears throat> and, and partly what was so important about how he functioned in his demonstration is that it was utterly dependent upon relationship, right relationship. Because as he indicated that, that <laughs> everyone and everything that arose were his, was his beloved, was his own form, was love bliss, was, was the, the one that was guiding him by virtue of the recognition response to his person. And these are extremely fine esoteric points, but they huh. actually aren't, they aren't, um, they aren't abstract, like it doesn't require profound intellectual intelligence. It doesn't require anything of the being except for the native intuition and the surrender of the individual to be able to be to receive this with greater and greater capacity to conduct it and to allow it to master the body mind. I, I, I just want to pick up on one thing that you said that the um his demonstration required a response. His demonstration required, mm -hmm. since it was always in relationship, or as you said, in context to the most intimate people around him, which was his devotees. And so I was reminded of Everything from being the world teacher to him, when devotees recognized him in that particular form, whether it be the thousand arms of uh, Volokha Teshvahara or the divine, it was, re it was the requirement of the response that allowed the revelation to come forward or it really so much depended on the understanding or the response that people had to what you're speaking about to who his true form was what his true yes. function was and exactly without, without that recognition all of this is just shitty chat exactly Precisely. Right. And he, he repeated that endlessly, endlessly, endlessly. It, it, his life had no purpose apart from the response. Right. None, none. Because in the Vedanta Temple event, all seeking as a seeming separate individual of Franklin, Franklin Jones ended, completely ended. And as you will recall, if you studied his life, he indicated at that point in time, he began to notice that all that was arising was relationship with everyone and everything in his own psyche, in his own body, mind, in his own being. In other words, he realized the non-difference, the non-separation, the absolute prior unity within which the conscious, aware, feeling, being, the self, the, the divine reality self, actually is not separate from anyone and anything at all I'm so there's also, no ca capability no capability for recoil also i was recently doing some work with ken wilbur and his writings and one of the <laughs> criticisms that ken wilbur wrote in his writings and told his followers or his students or whoever. The criticism that he had with Adida, and this is exactly to the point that you're speaking about, or the, 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 the misunderstanding <laughs> as, as I hear it, and Ken Wilber's misunderstanding. He said, if Adida was truly a world teacher, he would enter the world as a world teacher. He would come into the world in the position or the, in the proclamation 
of that. And what I'm hearing from you, and my understanding also is that it was required of the the person or the the people to recognize Adida, not Adida to be in proclaiming anything to you, to the person, to the world, as if he was just a person with a great message, like a prophet coming in, or Jesus walking into a marketplace, performing miracles or whatever, is that this whole thing is thrown on its head in a lot of ways from the conventional understanding of a great revelation or a great awakening that was given to him since this all this duality that gets confused where people don't fully understand it's really truly your you you the the person individually have to wake up to some level of comprehension not that that comprehension can actually be given to you it's almost like riding a bike. I mean, you can talk to people about how to ride a bike, but guess what? You have to get on and ride a bike. You have to do it. Yeah. So people can paint pictures, uh, write books, and talk and talk and talk and talk. But it's always that subject-object. It's like there is out there. You got to go <coughs> to that. You know, it's it's true. It's a it's a very complex and as you were pointing to an esoteric understanding, truly. Yes, yes, yes. So, um, thank you for bringing up Ken Wilbur because I, um, of course, we have profound respect for him, and uh, and also acknowledge um, Adi Da's uh, love for him you know, through the years of, of our, of my awareness of, of Ken Wilbur, even though I, I have, I have done some study of what he has done and have been aware of like his endorsement very early on. And then a little bit about his process, but what I, um, I have an intuition that is, uh, and I feel it's appropriate enough to speak here, um, about it because, uh, Ken Wilber is one who has had a profound effect on humanity in the world, quote unquote. So, but what I would like to present is that um, what makes what Adi Da did not in the world? Okay. So, what is the world? Where is the world? <laughs> Who is the world? Why is what we did not part of the world? And I can particularly ask this question because Hani Topper said to me, ah, the world has come to me at last. <laughs> and <laughs> of course, that's been a, 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 a contemplation or consideration, not about me, but the nature of his work and what he was working with, which meant no matter what arises, whether it be apparently uh, mundane, profane, ordinary, uh, practical survival, uh, heart needs, love, um, well-being, uh, psychic, mystical, uh, phenomenal, extraordinary, otherworldly, you know, the whole spectrum whatever the world or life is, the possibilities for those aspects of acknowledging existence and feeling the implications of them and taking responsibility for them and growing in them are required of you no matter where you are. No matter who you are. <laughs> oh, this is, this is, I hear you. This is where it gets, you really do have to have some sophisticated or some kind of comprehension because as he says, and this is the primary illusion or the the, the split in, in one's brain core or body mind or perception or ever how you want to say this and that, is that when persons 
of whatever understanding, wake up to whatever level, even if it's a pre-developed mind like Adida had, what he has always been pointing to is that there isn't a world that is separate from who you are. This is the paradox of where well, what we're really speaking about, is that you really do have to wake up to what the Indians said that was the illusion or what Einstein's equation demonstrated scientifically that the material was the energy and the energy was the material. And there really is simultaneous, yeah. synchronistic, yeah. transcendental. Yeah. I mean, this this is the fundamental 21st century primer. It is ground zero to understand yes. that this is the footing. Yes. This is the footing <laughs> without a foundation <laughs> um, that you really have to get to. Because yes. that's where you start from. Well, and, and for very real reasons. This this is an aspect in which this the incarnation aspect of spiritual realization is that's what this realm is all about. The red yellow realm, this gross psychophysical manifestation. <clears throat> so and to bring um bring down and, and to acknowledge also Ken Wilbur's comment, not just to dismiss it, because I do right. also understand what he's asking. Which is, which is that there are distinctions, clearly, to be made. And things are real enough in terms of the way to acknowledge the way someone lives, the differences, the uniqueness, um, what you do in, a, in different cultures and how you make money and how you, you know, what you're interested in. And are, there's all those distinctions that <clears throat> are not a problem. Um, but in terms of being in the world now this will get very personal okay about Adi Don about our life with him to perhaps try to help people understand in part why he lived the way that he did and this also links to an understanding of how when truth has come into the world in the form of great beings throughout time there has been incredible resistance incredible taboos and fear and even to the point of people being killed because of this now i'm not being dramatic or exaggerating here and it it, it is an important part of his seventh stage demonstration is that um it isn't true that he didn't enter into the world at all, it's just simply not true because he was born in the world, he lived in the world. It was not until, as you in, in the early 1970s, that he began to interact and work with people. He was in the world at that point, established his own bookstore. I mean, took full responsibility for what he had to do in the world with devotees based upon how people were responding to him and what he noticed about how the met his meditation was no longer about separate self subjectivity but was established in realization and that that was the nature of his relationship that was what he recognized in everyone and everything was the same self condition and thus he worshiped his devotees as his own form as his own bliss as his own beloved and it was this reciprocal relationship that we lived with him in this love recognition i mean just even just saying that whoo, rivets this being in in the center pole and the spherical form of his person at heart you know where it, every cell comes alive in the um the the tangible awareness of bright being as this as our fundamental condition and <laughs> what what i'd like to bring up the fact is that arida said that he was not a quote unquote, public person. And that right. the, the, the role or the response of the devotee, the devotee was to be the face and the person being the demonstration of who Arida was. Yes, yes, as he said, I, not as a separate other, but the self-condition replaces you and you replace me. It's this, it's this reciprocation where no longer is there an other, like there's no longer an other guru. There's no longer an other 
um, that we're always seeking for outside ourselves, you know, that's just not even reachable, maybe billions of lifetimes in advance and very, very few within any given lifetime. And my God, if you even say anything about some kind of realization of God, you're blasphemous. You know, I mean, these, these parochial, provincial, archaic notions about the nature of the divine reality and God are really so prominent that it's it's like um, like literally a, a um, you know a metallic unbreakable metallic encasement of trying to shift a paradigm outside itself you know to awaken to the truth of what all of these elemental things are doing and and why they exist and what their purpose is and and what what we're supposed to serve with one another and so it's a huge ordeal for for anyone to accept that that um, what we have presumed to be the nature of, of reality and God is, to put it bluntly, ass backwards. I mean, it's, it's just not it, you know, and that um, everybody has built their life and their sense of self and value upon an, an, a lie, you know, about the nature of their person and their condition. And this is why Adi Da has always been so controversial. Because he has gone beyond the fear of, of his fidelity to his function and this revelation was so fierce that he could not compromise. He, he simply had no capability to compromise except for to communicate it in all the fashions that he did. And there was, there, there was an integrity, an incredible integrity in his person. But we began to notice that, um, mm, yes, dangerous. Not him, him, not he being dangerous, but our lives were actually being threatened. Well, I'm not, you know, I, I'm a student of many different disciplines, and I can mention just a couple. One, one that I'm recently involved with is the law school at Harvard, now that I'm close to Boston. And when I okay. listen to somebody like Noah Feldman, who's a professor at Harvard, and he's a constitutional scholar and biographer of James Madison and knows the when you listen to the the genius of somebody like Noah Feldman who speaks in historical terms about conflicting things with Alexander Hamilton and James Madison whatever you and then the trying to work out the constitution and different differences you can see that there's a certain point that they will not go beyond, and that is actually destroying the structure. And that's really what is required to fully understand because you can't hold any architectural, historical, the savannas of of, of, of Africa being the formation and the, and, the, and the beginning of time and history and mankind and, uh, you know, from Cro-Magnum man to ag agriculture, this kind of linear, sequential, material development of time. That, to, to, to understand Adida, you really cannot hold to Ooh. these abs, absolutes <clears throat> of, of this, what really is a 17th century invention or through scientific understanding and all of this stuff. I mean, it really undermines the conventional understanding of the world, of man, of, of of the, the, the architecture, the geology mm. of the world as a, as a common understanding. And if you don't, if you go outside those boundaries, you're either in a psychosis or mysticism or something. Right, right, yeah. right. Yes, yes. So this, this is why Adida uses the word reality. <clears throat> real. What is real? So you're describing what the inheritance of mankind has been in terms of what's allowed to be defined as real. Right. And, and, and in Adida's communication, he makes the distinction very clear. 
you know, that, that yes, this is real, but he uses the small r, you know, um, to make a distinction between that and what is real, what is real in the self position, which is consciousness, which is encompassing all of this. So what mm-hmm. you're describing about the, the parameters of what's allowed, <clears throat> those you, I mean, from the disposition and the condition of consciousness itself, awake as that as reality, the real condition of the self, not the one that recoils and defines through identification with just what how it's appearing now in space-time, as it seems, which will just be soon to be expected. The only thing we really know is going to happen will be poof, it's gone. You know, it's always changing. You can never hold on to it. <coughs> um, <laughs> I keep feeling... I keep feeling the force of his presence so strongly in terms of the paradox of what we're speaking about right. that um, well, and then yeah. anchoring it back, anch- anchoring it back into um, the present reality is that, yes, well, it, it, it is confounding. It literally uh, dissolves the mind. Yes, it does. In, in it, terms, does. It, it, it does. And, and I just keep feeling that falling into you know, and then my heart opens up and I feel um, incredible compassion um, and, and I want to speak then to how Beloved demonstrated that. Like I indicated in, this, in the phase of the seventh stage um, processes where at the point where he um, was so submitted in the world to people off the street for so long, where we just came and asked him all sorts of questions. And it was even, he was involved in his process of transfiguration and transformation, you know, where his uh, whole psychophysical mechanism was going through the process of what occurs when the bright enters the being so profoundly that it begins to show unique signs of being transfigured and transformed for a specific divine purpose. And we notice those signs in him. It's obvious when you look at him. Look at all the many changes that he went through. Um, You know, look at what he um, manifested and reflected in direct relationship to anyone and anything or anything he was considering. He was literally a mirror, literally a mirror. Mm -hmm. And, um, and, and, And a mirror in reflecting the bhava of the samadhi. Um, of either Sahaj, Nirvikalpa, or whatever, in, in direct open eyes, you know, directly in relationship. So it, it, one of the, another uh, um, way to feel his process is to actually watch his darshan as he granted it from the very earliest time until the end of his life. And <clears throat> as I described earlier, the feeling of the reception of him that I received even prior to going into his physical company is exactly that same bright person. Literally, that's how I know Adi Da. And the knowing is a, is a heart knowledge. You know, the, the Amrita Nadi, the form of love bliss, the bride itself. That's how I know his person. That is the yoga of the samadhi, of the intimacy that stands prior to, and yet this is all encompassed in the spherical bright form. Uh, literally, that is so. And this awareness is not, I'm not psychotic, I'm not, you know, having some sort of strange trance samadhi or other, or the God talked to me on the mountain. I mean, yes, I've had various experiences of those kind numerous times, but the, the only thing that persists in the midst of those occasional arisings, or even maybe if they're very, very often, is the, aware, the feeling conscious awareness of the context in which, in which it's all arising. That's the nature of my feeling connection to beloved the fidelity to that ground the the that condition is is uh is what husbands effortlessly husbands the motions and movements of this persona you know to to come into being able to hopefully communicate something about his life because Every person who's ever had anything to do with Adi Da, whether they want to acknowledge it now or not, they are in the process of his divine self-revelation. And each individual, whoever they are or forever how long, they actually have been initiated into this awakening. And and everyone and everything has not only been awakened into this um, 
who is consciously aware of it, but he indicated many, 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 many times, notice, notice, be sensitive to my signs, notice the shift. And his person that you are meant to notice is one that cannot be controlled or owned by experience, um, which seems, again, paradoxical because he's saying, notice, what are you noticing? You know, are you noticing the signs of the conscious reality self beginning to manifest and awaken beings? Or are you seeking to see experiential signs of, of extraordinary miracles and phenomena? All of those things will occur inevitably. They, they do. They, that's just part of the makeup, the psychophysical makeup of the being. Mm. Right. And he, as he says, they, they will occur, but with the understanding that he's always given is that you'll just notice it because it's only a matter of purification depending on your karmas or your parabda karmas or whatever your karmas are you will transform those as you are in any understanding whether some a dog barks and you don't respond to the barking you hear the barking there is the barking but you're not responding to the barking you're not yes. identified with it because these are all purification. You're still in the world, quote unquote world. You still have body mind. You still yes, have exactly. And that's the world. That's the world that we're speaking of. The world is rising and falling. Right. Perpetual, right. Mo perpetual motion machine of rising and falling of every possibility. Mind is world. World is mind. She is mind unhusbanded it's chaos husbanded it is a beauty a creative art form through which you make use of all of the elements to serve the divine awakening purpose so i want to go back to the original question about the transfiguration transformation and the translation and the indifference it seems like this is only really occurring in the renunciation of the realization, in the movement away or transcending the world. It seems like the transfiguration, the transformation, the translation, the indifference are all occurring within the renunciation phase or the renunciation aspect of the well, mm -hmm. okay, so that's a very good question and 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 good um, point to 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 agree and clarify. Um, and maybe because I'm looking way, at the time, I'm, I'm looking oh, okay. at the time. Maybe to pick up if you will, if okay. we could hold, if yeah. we could hold, yeah. we could hold hold that. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, okay. perfect. All right. <laughs> So let's <laughs> let's just take this moment to say thank you very much, Julie. I'm 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 going to speak for the audience because I do know that people really appreciate your conversation with me, and I really want to again thank you for staying in touch and responding to my inquiries. And I look forward to sooner than later to finish up on this conversation. Okay, anytime. I, I'm grateful. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thanks so very much.